Hi everyone, my name is Paulo. I'm a postdoctoral research fellow. So to start, we know that species can only survive and reproduce within a limited range of environmental conditions. And we normally call this limited range as the species niche. The interesting thing is that we can use real-life evidence data to characterize what the species niche actually is in nature. For instance, here we have evidence data of the wood thrush, which is a North American breeding bird, against the maximum temperature. And we can note that it's not present um, in all the values within the maximum temperature range. So we can use this data to determine, to characterize what is the observed tolerance of the species to the maximum temperature again in nature. Another, another interesting uh, aspect is uh, that we can observe also places in the, in the space in which the species is more frequent and more evident and this may be related to the species optimum, the observational optimum of the species for this given environmental variable. And we can combine many of these, of those axes, different environmental axes with evidence data to create a n-dimensional hypervolume that theoretically represents the niche of a species. For instance, here I combine the maximum temperature and the precipitation to create this figure. And it's interesting to note that there's a region, a climatic region there, which represents the places in which the species is more frequent and more importantly, again, more abundant. And we can see that this is the optimum climatic zone for the species, for these two variables, precipitation and maximum temperature. But the fact is that this theoretical representation have a correspondence, correspondence in the geographical space, because um, species are interacting with the environmental variables and with one another in the geographical space. So here, again, we have the data for the same species in the same years with latitude and longitude. And again, we can clearly see that there's a window there in which the species reaches a higher evidences than anywhere. And this is now in the geographical space, the optimum climatic or environmental zone for these species. But climate change is altering the geographical distribution of this climatic niche space in the geographical space. For instance, here we have the latitudinal gradient and the maximum temperature for 1966 and the mean temperature, the mean maximum temperature is 25.82 with a standard deviation of 4.8. But when we come to 2018, we have an increase of more than one degree in the maximum temperature around 50 years later. So now it's 26.99. And also we have an increase in the standard deviation with now it's around 5.5. Uh, so we are increasing the mean maximum temperature with climate change and also the variability. So we have some places reaching higher maximum temperatures while others are, um, have lower maximum temperatures. And how will species respond to that in the space? So having the temperature, the latitudinal temperature gradient as an example, species can spatially track their optimum. So uh, mostly those species that are 
badger like birds they can uh, go after or chase those climatic uh, optimum zones in which they can have higher evidences and a higher fitness uh, to be more more clear so think about space and the latitudinal uh, temperature gradient so some species that like colder regions might be going up through time with an increase in the mean temperature and the maximum temperature and the species that like uh, hotter places they can be uh, going southwards also we can see changes in population sizes again some species can a few species can can be benefited from these changes and have positive uh, population size values especially if um, the, the its competitors are getting less and less abundant uh, in some regions for whatever reason and other species they can have negative population uh, trends um, because they they are exposed to new pathogens and other density dependent uh, factors so the first thing to investigate this phenomenon the first thing we need is a proper way of characterizing the species evidences along broad-scale gradients so uh, the amazing people at primer they developed this new uh, way of characterizing not only evidence but biomass and other data along broad scale gradients that they call the mod skirt mean function it's a really flexible function that can accommodate different degrees of kurtosis skewness and etc but i want to focus on two parameters the first is the model position of the species along the gradient so uh, if we plot the evidence of a species in a gradient latitude no values or temperature so where it achieves its maximum mean evidence here for example we have the model position the model latitudinal position for the wood thrush uh, which was estimated with the mod skirt mean function which is the black line here in this graph and we see that the place in which it reaches its higher mean evidence is around 38 latitude node degrees and the other parameter that i want to call your attention is the estimated mean evidence of the species at the modal position so these can be used as a proxy for uh, as an indicator of population size over time so clearly the outcomes i was talking to you about of changes in the spatial model position and changes in population sizes can be directly linked to this h and m mod skirt parameters so we applied this um, new modeling framework to the north america breeding bird survey data set which consists of annual bird count data from 1966 to 2019 and the complete data set have more than 700 bird taxa but we had some inclusion criteria to 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 analyze our data so first the species had to to, to present at least 50 non-zero values for at least 10 years second um, the species with we excluded species with less than 70 percent of their breeding distribution if they were uh, migratory species or 70 percent of the resident distribution if they were non-migratory or resident species so covered by the the roots or the the sampling space in north america we also removed taxonomic uncertainties 
and primarily nocturnal species, given that the data is collected uh, at the local sunrise. So we ended up with 194 bird species, among which uh, 175 are uh, occur in the western region and 147 occur in the eastern region. We decided to uh, have two separate analyses, given that it's widely known that mostly because of the Rocky Mountains, the east and western regions of the United States, they have different climatic influences. Um, so we decided to split the data set in these two regions. So for detecting temporal trends for each combination of bird uh, evidence and year, we ran the Modskirt pathway that I, I don't have time to explain to you now because of time, uh, but uh, a paper explaining it will come out soon with both a, frequent, a frequentist approach and also a Bayesian approach. So, and for this pathway, we had latitude as the x axis because we were interested in the latitudinal modal position changing over time. And then for the estimated H and M for each bird, which is combining all years, getting the M and H for each year, we run the GLS models with AR1 or AR2 correlation structures, which was chosen based on AIC, whether it was AR1 or 2. So uh, here I'm going to focus on the temporal trends in M. So we had around 44% of significant temporal trends in M. So, and among them, uh, around 45% of species, they had significant southward trends, which means that over time, the places in which its mean maximum abundance gets its higher values is going southwards over time. On the other hand, 55% had positive uh, trends, which means northward trends. So over time, their, their maximum abundance, the, the point in space in which it's, it, it reaches its maximum abundance is getting higher over time, going northwards, northwards for the eastern region. For the western region, we had 41% again of temporal trends, significant temporal trends in M, and 44, uh, around 34% southward trends, and 66% of northward trends. So pro proportionally, uh, the species that responded in the western region, they, they have a, a higher tendency to go northwards than in the eastern region. So uh, a couple take homes, uh, actually the main take home for now is that two fifths of this analyzed species, they exhibited changes in their estimated model position. And the mean uh, change in model position is a, a quite high, which is dot 2.52 degrees it's the mean change and I I brought some uh, notable examples for you to to visually check what I'm talking to you about so here for instance we have the common grackle and its model position over time we can see that there's a clear a positive trend the common grackle is a adaptable species and its range is expanding in North America and it's also have uh, huge flocks and it's considered in some regions as an agricultural pest. Again with a positive um, trend we have the California scrub jay it's typically found in a quite dry open uh, wood in the west coast and again we can clearly see a positive tendency of the species so its optimum its climatic optimum is probably a changing not northwards and the species is following it 
and with negative tendencies um, as in a, a couple examples we have the keel deer which is the most widespread plover in North America with a clear uh, movement downwards southwards uh, in its in the, in the point in which it reaches its maximum abundance and again uh, as an example of ne a negative trend we have the tree swallow which lives in a wide variety of habitats but it's limited by woodpecker holes to like build its nests so what are our next steps so um, we'll do a meta regression analysis with the, the, the standardized slopes of H and M uh, including the climatic data so we can actually link the changes we are observing with increases in the mean temperature or maximum temperature over time and we are also planning to include the species characteristics such as trophic level habitat body size dispersal capability geographical spread and see what are the the, the birds that are the characteristics of the birds that are responding the most so uh, this is our team. We have Professor Marty Anderson and Professor Winston uh, that developed the Modskirt models. And we have these couple of brilliant and amazing guys, which are Andrew and Hayden. And I'm really grateful that I have the opportunity to, to, be, to, to develop this research with those uh, fellows. So um, thank you very much. Uh, I'll be Stranger Things. <laughs> I'll be available uh, by email or Twitter or Slack or whatever channel you want to uh, chat about our research. And thanks for watching.